Hello everyone, this is Professor Keen. We've been talking about the speed of falling objects. And specifically, we've been talking about Galileo's discussion of how quickly objects fall when dropped in some medium. The puzzle that we were considering is related to the speed of objects falling through a medium such as water when those two objects are made of the same material. Remember where we were at, um, Galileo had argued that the weight of an object does not affect the speed of fall. He did some experiments with pendulums, which seemed to suggest this. Salviati then brings up this puzzle. What if we were to drop a rock and a grain of sand in water? If we were to do this, you would find that the rock falls with some high acceleration. So it will have at any particular instant in time, it will have a large velocity, whereas the grain of sand will have a comparatively small velocity. So the velocity of the rock will be greater than the velocity of the sand. And if, as Galileo was arguing, the weight of the object does not dictate the speed of fall, then how is this the case? Because this is what happens. Well, one possible solution, which ends up being a bad solution or an inadequate solution, is that the buoyancy affects these two objects differently. Why didn't that work? Well, the acceleration of an object when falling in a medium is equal to the acceleration that it would have when falling in a vacuum, but corrected by this factor here, one minus the density of the medium divided by the density of the object. This is the effect of buoyancy on objects falling in media. Well, why doesn't this explain this situation? That's easy to see, because the medium they're both falling through is water, so there's the same medium here, and the objects have the same density because, after all, they're the same material, let's say limestone, so they have the same density. So they should, according to this formula, have the exact same acceleration, but they don't. Therefore, this does not adequately capture what's going on. So the effect of buoyancy does not account, or cannot account, for the different speeds of two objects having the same density, same density and falling in the same medium. Okay, so that's an important point to realize. So what is the cause of the discrepancy in their speeds? Well, what we had touched on last time is that they each experience a second effect and that is drag. Okay, so buoyancy can't account for it, but drag does account for it. And this is what Galileo is going to argue. Drag does account for the difference in speed. How does he account for this? And that's what we're going to explore right now. So what again is drag? It is basically a frictional force acting between a liquid and an object through, that is falling through that liquid. And so the one that has a larger surface area is going to experience more drag and fall more slowly, or so the argument goes. Okay, so this is... Salviati claims that, according to Salviati, the object with larger surface area, area will experience more drag, or greater drag. And you might already see the problem with this, or at least the puzzle this presents. And this is exactly what Simplicio raises. So what is the question that arises now? Simplicio says, wait a minute, if, as you're saying, the one with a larger surface area experiences more drag, and the larger object obviously has larger surface area, shouldn't the larger object experience more drag and hence fall more slowly? If drag depends, is proportional to, I'll put an alpha sign for proportional to surface area, and if the larger object, which it does, the larger object has more surface area, SA surface area, then it should fall more slowly, which it doesn't, which it does not. So Simplicio seems to identify a fatal flaw in this drag explanation. What is the answer to this? How does Salviati address this? Well, he says, you know, it's true that the larger object has more surface area, but compared to its volume, it does not. And this is the key point that Galileo makes. And so he talks a bit about how the volume and the surface area scale with the size of the object. So let me just write out the answer that Salviati provides. He says that shrinking a body, whatever body it is, shrinking a body decreases both its surface area as Simplicio noticed, and its weight. 
but the weight decreases faster, decreases more quickly. Whoops, go back. Decreases more quickly. Let's do an example. So how do we know this? So for example, I want you to imagine a, uh, I'm gonna go over here where I have more room. Imagine that we have a tiny cube. I'm not gonna consider spheres, I'm gonna consider cubes because they're a little bit easier to, to calculate things with, okay? And let's suppose this cube has a length of one centimeter on this side, one centimeter on this side, and one centimeter on this side. Okay, so it's a one cubic centimeter object. What is the surface area of this object? Well, this surface right here has a surface area of one square centimeter, and likewise this one and this one and so on. So you can see right away that this has a surface area of one times six is six square centimeters, right? What about the volume of this object? The volume of this one centimeter on a side object? Well, it's one cubic centimeter, one centimeter cubed, right? Okay, well, what about if we were to double the size of it? So we were to make, instead of one centimeter on a side, we were to make it two centimeters on a side. Okay, so let's draw this right here. This is two centimeters on this side, two on this side, and two on this side, right? What is the surface area of this? Well, the surface area of each one of these is one square centimeters, and there are four on this side, right? And four times six, so we should have a surface area of 24 square centimeters. And what is the volume of this object? Well, you take two, square, two centimeters on this side times two on that side, which would be four, and then multiply by two, it's going to have an area, I'm sorry, a volume of eight cubic centimeters, right? Let's put this over here. And just for sake of completeness, maybe not completeness, but to go a little bit further, let's take an object that has a length of three centimeters on each side. So this is like a Rubik's cube, I suppose. I want you to be thinking ahead as to what the surface area and the volume of this is going to be. So you probably can figure this out right away. The surface area is gonna be what? Well, this one has nine square centimeters. Nine times six is 54 square centimeters. And the volume of this object is what? Three times three is nine times three is 27 cubic centimeters. Okay, so we've been considering these cubic objects but we could have done this with spheres, changing the radius and looking at the surface area and the volume and how they change, or any other kind of funny shaped object. And generally speaking, generally speaking, the surface area is going to be proportional to some diameter or length, some length dimension or diameter. I'm sorry, D for diameter, the diameter of the square, or the side length, the diameter squared. And the volume is going to be proportional to the diameter cubed, right? So notice here, that as you increase the length of the sides, if you increase the length of a side, the volume goes up more rapidly than the surface area. They both increase, but the question is which one goes up more quickly. As you get larger, the volume goes up as diameter cubed, so it goes up more rapidly than the surface area. And likewise, as you shrink something, the volume decreases more rapidly than the surface area. If you were to try to, if, if you had certain effects that depended on the volume and other effects that depended on the surface area, and you wanted to find how those effects um, compared to one another as you were to increase or decrease the size of the object, you might be interested in the ratio of the volume to the surface area of an object. Well, the volume of an object is gonna go as a, as a diameter or the length cubed. The surface area is gonna go as a diameter or the length squared. So this is going to go as the diameter. In other words, the volume compared to the, the volume effects compared to the surface area effects, as you make it bigger, they're going to go, the ratio goes as the diameter. Okay, so as, the diameter goes down, the ratio of the volume to the, the surface area also goes down. Okay, does that make sense? Or we might say that the ratio of the surface area to the volume goes up. In other words, as you shrink something, anything that depends on the surface area compared to the volume is gonna become more important. And since drag depends on the surface area, the drag becomes relatively more important relative to the volume, relatively more important. So the very fact that this thing falls is due to the fact that it has some weight in the medium, right? So if it didn't have any weight in the medium, it wouldn't fall. So the fact that it has weight means that it falls. 
but the fact that it slows down due to drag, that depends on the surface area. And since the relative importance of the surface area to the drag gets larger, I'm sorry, to the, to the weight gets larger as you shrink the object, the drag becomes relatively more important as it shrinks. So small objects experience drag in a more pronounced way pronounced way when falling through a liquid. We have not, um, this will, I think we'll do a better job at deriving this kind of thing mathematically when we get to understanding Newton's laws and applying those. But what Galileo is doing is providing a qualitative, a semi-quantitative explanation of this sort of thing, okay? This, by the way, you might be familiar with this kind of effect. Um, this, is, this is important, for example, when swimming. So I don't know if you've ever noticed that um, large swimmers can actually swim more quickly than small swimmers. Why is that? Well, the power that you have when swimming is really proportional to your, your stroke power, which is proportional to your muscle mass. So how big your muscles are is how quickly you can propel yourself. Your drag, on the other hand, is not proportional to your muscle mass or volume. It's proportional to your surface area. So as you're larger, your muscle mass goes up as your volume, but your drag only goes up as your surface area. And therefore, when you're larger, you actually can swim more quickly than a small person. This is why lar the large swimmers tend to be faster than small swimmers. Okay. Um, this is also an interesting thing that shows up in, in um, organisms, the effect of volume and surface area. There's some interesting articles. One is called On Being the Right Size. When I, uh, maybe I'll write this down at the bottom here. If you're interested in the effect of size and scale on living organisms, there's some nice articles. One is called On Being the right size, the right size. This is by John Haldane. It's an older article, but very fascinating. This is from 1926. Um, and that talks about how, um, we'll come back to this later also, but uh, the small organisms are more robust than large organisms to fracture. So if you, you know, if you drop a mouse from a high height, it will just be stunned and run away. If you drop a rat, it will get killed. If you drop a man from a high height, he'll be broken. And if you drop a horse from a high height, he will splash. So kind of vivid, vivid terminology there. But the idea is that the robustness to fracture depends on the size of an object. There's also an interesting chapter, chapter three, in a book called Comparative Biomechanics. Comparative Biomechanics by a guy named Stephen Vogel. He's at Duke. And this is a chapter on size and scale. It's very interesting. Um, but one of the things that the, both of these talk about is that small organisms need to feed their bodies um, and the amount of nutrients they need is proportional to their mass, which is proportional to their volume. But they take in their food through their surface. And so the, 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 way, the amount of food they can take in per unit time is proportional to their surface area, but the amount they need is proportional to their volume. So if you have a small organism, the surface area is pretty big compared to its volume. But as an organism gets larger and larger, its volume goes up at a higher rate than its surface area. So they are incapable of bringing in nutrients through their surface in order to feed the volume of their body. So what do they do? Well, they have surface area on the inside on the, in the form of intestines. So that's really a surface area that's very large inside of you that you put food into to absorb food to feed your body. So it's kind of the way that large organisms compensate for having a smaller surface area compared to their volume on the outside of themselves. Anyway, those are a few uh, comments and we'll come back and talk a bit more about the end of chapter four of a student's guide to the great physics texts next time.